it's a real honor today to be speaking on Father's Day. We are in the middle of the series we've been calling Modern Family, Ancient Design. And today we're going to talk about a parent's primary responsibility. And I know for myself, I have three kids and uh, I'm at that age where I'm watching them grow up and um, I'm beginning to wonder uh, what their shape their life will take as they move eventually from our house and uh, we have time uh, before that happens, but I'm beginning to think about that. I can see the days slipping away. And uh, I think about my, my kids, my family, and honestly, I, I feel very inadequate. Um, I feel inadequate to be uh, the spiritual leader that God has called me to be in my house because I know that God still has a lot of work to do in my life as well. But as parents, we are called to this task. And if there are children in our lives, we, are, we, we have no option. This is what we're called to. And uh, so we're going to dive into this today, talking about a parent's primary responsibility of helping their kids, helping our kids grow uh, as followers of Jesus. You know, maybe you've seen it. I have seen it in my life. I've seen kids who have grown up in the church and then something happens as they move out of their families and we, it's like, what, what happened? They're not involved in church. They're not following Jesus. And in fact, there's been some research that's been done and uh, there, it should alarm us a little bit that uh, the, there's a growing number of kids who move out of their homes uh, with mom and dad and they leave the church and many all together. In fact, the millennials, the generation that's moving out now has been moving out of their homes for a while. Uh, we would find out if we would look at research that actually uh, the, those who call themselves uh, saying having no religion has actually jumped by 10% in the last decade, up to some 36% of uh, millennials who would say that they have no religion. And uh, uh, the, the number who say that they are evangelical Christians has actually dropped to around 19%. And so we should be alarmed by that. We shouldn't panic, but we should be alarmed by that. And we should lean into what is our role and what's God want us to do. I do want to say here at the beginning, though, that this message is not just for parents. So you're coming today and you say, well, I'm not a parent. I want you to know that this is the lessons that God has for us today are lessons that any of us as followers of Jesus can grab a hold of and we can run with and we can uh, impl- uh, apply in our lives to anyone that we're trying to influence for Jesus. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna get to some practical uh, application of this, but before we do that, we wanna spend a little time going back to the very beginning, really where God created and began the family. And this is in Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, we see the story of creation where God creates light, he creates darkness, creates the the moon and the stars and the sun. He creates the water and the things that come upon the earth, that walk upon the earth, the fish of the sea. God creates everything and then he makes mankind. And the scripture tells us that God made man in his own image. And and the scripture tells us that he made God in his own image to be like him in a couple specific specific ways and won't spend too much time here but to talk about this for a second. God made man in his own image to be gifted intellectually, to be able to think rationally, to be a relational uh, being, to can relate to God and we can relate to other people and then to be good stewards of the world that God had given to man and woman. And then lastly, in the ethics and the character of God. Man and woman were made in his image. It's almost as if God had taken an imprint and put it upon them, his image upon man and woman. And what we read here in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28, we also read that God blessed them, the scripture says, and he told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. It's a very interesting concept to be fruitful, to multiply, and then, but then he says to fill the earth. And I think a lot of times when I've read this, I've thought, oh, that's really cool. God is in favor of lots of kids being born. And there being lots of kids everywhere, and they've grown up, and they have kids. And I, th- I do think that is right. But as we get further through here, and we get into the Bible, and we look here at what God was doing, we see that God had created man and woman in his image, 
And I want to make an argument that what God was up to is that he was about multiplying his image, multiplying his glory, not just that there be people throughout the whole earth, but that there be little images of him, little pieces of his glory throughout the whole earth. God wanted his image multiplied. Tragically, if, you, if you're familiar at all with the Bible, you know that the story changes. Just in two chapters, Genesis chapter 3, the story takes a tragic turn. The serpent comes to, to Eve, and Adam and Eve are tempted. The, the, the serpent told them, yeah, did God really say you couldn't eat from that tree? And did God really say if you ate from that tree that, that you would die? They gave in to that temptation, as we know. And really what man's original temptation was, was to be like God, to be like God knowing good and evil, but also to be independent of God. And we see the devastating consequences of this sin today. We're all dealing with it today. Genesis chapter two, excuse me, chapter three, verse 22 says, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Again, he's not saying that he was like God in the way that he had created him, but there's something about God that, he, that God did not impart to mankind that now they have. And it was specifically knowing good and evil. He, and then it says this, he will not be, uh, he will not, we will not allow him to reach out and take his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God says, we are not going to allow this mankind to live forever. He has become like us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to live forever. Why not? Because that would multiply that image, that corrupt image. And God was all about multiplying his image. Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 says this, that Adam repro reproduced a son. What? It actually says that he reproduced a son in his own image, in his own likeness. And so we see it beginning to take place. But then in the very next chapter, God says this, Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. Fill, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. You see, God, even though a multiplication of the human race was happening, it was not in the image that God had created. And so God says, it's filled with violence. It's not getting the results that God had desired, what his heart was longing for. And God, uh, mankind failed to multiply God's glory. So what happens? There in Genesis chapter 6, the, God says that he's going to bring a flood and he calls a man by the name of Noah and he tells Noah to build this big ark, this big boat and to bring the animals on two by two and they're on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights and at the end when the waters begin to come down, all the animals, everything, all the people upon the earth have been destroyed, Noah builds an altar. He builds an altar, he makes a sacrifice, and God makes a promise not to repeat the same curse. It's almost as if God resets the clock and let's do this thing again. And then the interesting thing happens, Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, God repeats the same command that he had given to Adam, he repeats it to Noah. He says this, as for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Again, was God just looking for lots of kids and lots of population growth? I don't think so. I think God was after his image being multiplied over the face of the earth, his goodness being multiplied over the face of the earth, his glory being multiplied over the face of the earth. Why else would he have wiped out all those who were causing violence? See, this is the story of mankind. This is really the story of the Old Testament that we see. And we could spend more time in the Old Testament talking through how man began to follow God and then they walked away from God. And it's this back and forth, the story continues. But Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14, gives us a glimpse again at God's heart of what God was after in the creation of the world. He says, it says this, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, God's heart was that his glory, his goodness, his image be multiplied over the face of the earth. And God says a day is coming when his image, his glory, will fill the whole earth as the waters cover the earth itself. 
God's desire from the beginning is that his image, his glory be multiplied. And then we turn the page from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And there were glimpses of this all along of what God was preparing to do. But we turn the page into the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus comes on the scene. No one has ever seen anything like him. He's the perfect image of God. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says this, that Jesus is the Son, and the Son is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being. He's the radiance of God's glory, and he's the exact representation of God. He is the image of God walking on the earth. It's fascinating to think about. One of my professors at Ozark Christian College said this about Jesus, Wilbur Fields. He said, only in Jesus can we see what man would have been like if man were in full harmony with God. Jesus was perfect man as well as perfect God. So we can look at Jesus in the pages of the New Testament and we can say, oh yeah, there, there are elements of his character, elements of things that he did that God wanted for us. Now there's some things I think that we look at the scriptures and that, it was not for us, but there's, we, see, we see the perf, perfect image of God and what God was up to in the world. Jesus showed us what life would have been like if it were not for the fall, but he also shows us what it would be like once Jesus renewed us. Jesus was and he is today the exact representation of God. He was without sin, he healed the sick, he calmed raging storms, he cast out demons, he raised the dead, and he taught, I love this about Jesus, he taught with absolute authority. He was on the move. He, it's estimated that Jesus would have walked some 3,000 miles just in his three years of ministry. He would have walked with his feet some 3,000 miles just in those three years. Just in Galilee alone, there were 175 villages. And we can record that Jesus visited every one of those villages on his feet. Jesus would have touched some 200,000 people just a day or two in each place. And we haven't begun to talk about Judea and, Jer and Jerusalem and Samaria. Jesus was on the move. Say, what, what was Jesus doing? Yeah, he was healing people. He was helping people. He was loving people. But I think it's very clear what Jesus was up to. He wanted to see his glory. He wanted to see the image of God multiplied. And so he went out and he was filling the earth with the image of God, drawing people to himself so that people could come to know him, so that they could be made new. His message was this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And people flocked to him. Some people came to him. I know they came to him just because they wanted the stuff that he had, but others came to him because they wanted to give their lives to him. They wanted to follow him. The sinners, the broken, the lost, the bruised, even the religious came to Jesus and they said, I want to follow you. See, Jesus was ushering in a new kingdom. And this kingdom was all about what God was doing in the beginning. It was a restoration of what God was doing in creation. Mankind was being restored to the image of God. And through Jesus' death, through his burial, through his resurrection, a way was opened so that man and woman could be restored to this life that God had for them in the beginning. They could be restored in the ways of Jesus, of following Jesus, to restore his image. The same thing that God was up to in the beginning was what God was up to in the time of Jesus, and it's the same thing that he's up to today. And this is what he does when Jesus comes into our lives. With those who surrender their lives to him and they begin to follow him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. See, God is all about making us new, remaking us into the image of God, what he was up to in the beginning. I love 
this idea that Jesus paints. And Jesus says some crazy things. One of the things that Jesus says, he says that you will actually, he tells his disciples, you will actually do things greater than I did. Think about that for a second. That's pretty crazy to think about. No, you're Jesus. Jesus says, no, you will do greater things than I will do. Jesus also said this, Luke chapter six, verse 40, the student is not above his teacher. For everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So Jesus is saying is when you become a fully devoted follower of Jesus, you will actually become to look like Jesus. That's something to think about, isn't it? Jesus says that we will become to look like him. So what should a follower of Jesus look like? What should a follower of Jesus look like? And when we're thinking about our children, when we're thinking about others that we're influencing for Jesus, what is God wanting for them? Well, let's look at the words of Jesus. Mark chapter one, verse 17. Jesus says this, he says, come follow me. I think that's a key. Come follow me. First John chapter two, verse six says this, whoever claims to live as Jesus, live in him must live as Jesus did. Some versions say that those who claim to live in Jesus, they must walk as Jesus did. You see, a follower of Jesus should look like Jesus, or in other words, should look like God, the image of God. Do you see what God is up to in the world? This thing we call Christianity, this thing we call church, do you see what God is up to in the world? Parent, mother, father, do you see what God wants to do through you? He wants to create people he wants to multiply people through your family. He wants to multiply followers of Jesus who are made in the image of God, who have been remade in the image of God. He is not looking to dust you off. Just to kind of clean you up and knock some of the, the dust off your boots. He's not looking just to help you stop cussing or drinking or to stop kicking your dog, right? Through Jesus, our gracious Father is reforming us and making us into his design. The design that he had from the very beginning to be like him and to reflect his image. A disciple of Jesus should look and act just like Jesus. I think about my own life, my own life growing up in the church, and I am so grateful for godly parents who had me at the church building uh, so often, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, we, we would be there and we would we were around God's people. And uh, I'm so grateful for that heritage. But there was a time in my teenage years where I really thought that being a Christian was about kind of having this get out of jail free card so that I would not go to hell. I don't know if you can relate with that at all, but that's something that I really struggled with. And even when I was dealing with sin in my life, at that time in my life, that, you know, I'm gonna repent of this sin, I'm gonna confess of this sin, but it's really because I don't wanna go to hell. I don't know if you can relate with that, but I do think that many Christians today, they kind of live like that. That's their relationship with God, is I'm gonna come do this thing because I don't wanna go to hell someday. We ask other questions like this. We say, how can we keep our kids in church? Rather, sometimes we ask other questions. How can the church help my kids stay out of trouble? Let me just tell you right now, these are not the best questions. They're not bad questions, they're just not the best questions. This is a better question. How can we best ensure that our kids become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We talk around here about helping others follow Jesus. How can we as parents help others, our kids? It could be other people that we're trying to influence for Jesus. How can we best help them follow Jesus? It's really simple. Look like Jesus. Act like Jesus. The very image of God. And you're saying, whoa, I can't do that. I realize that. We're going to get to that part here in a minute. Yeah, we can't do it on our own. But I want to tell you today that there are no 10 easy, quick steps to happy, healthy children. I wish I had that. You follow these 10 steps and everything's going to work out. 
I just don't think it works that way. There are some things that we, and, I, and I'm sure some of you could come up with some much more creative ways that we can help our kids grow in Jesus. But I want to nail down the fact that, that, that we need to be followers of Jesus in order for our kids to be followers of Jesus. Do you want to help others follow Jesus? Be a follower of Jesus yourself and help them follow Jesus as well. This is more caught than taught, you know. And too often, I think that we, we are tempted to try to teach it rather than model it. Nothing wrong with teaching it. We need to be teaching as we're modeling it. But we can't just talk about it. We have to model it. I remember vividly um, in my growing up years, my teenage years, I had a, a really good friend of mine who his parents, they had a bad habit. I'm going to mention the bad habit, but they had a bad habit. And they would do that in front of us. And uh, they would say things like this. Now, hey, son, you don't do this. We're grown-ups. We do it. But you don't do this. Well, you know what happened with that. Within just a few short years, my buddy is doing the exact same thing. And not only is he doing the exact same thing, but he's doing the exact same thing with his mom and dad. See, it's more caught than taught. Our kids are watching us and other people are watching us. And they're saying... They're actually looking for the right way to go, but we have to model it for them. A disciple of Jesus should look like Jesus in a couple of different ways. And I'm just going to lay those out and then we're going to spend some time unpacking those. First of all, in our identity. Second of all, in our character. And third, in the mission in which he's called us to. If we can model these characteristics to our children and others around us who we want to influence for Jesus, if we can attempt to model these around them, I think that we give our, ch our, uh, our kids a chance, a good chance of thriving as followers of Jesus as well. So here we go, three steps. I said I wasn't gonna give you steps, but I am gonna give you three of them, okay? Not 10, but three. Three steps to helping your children follow, follow Jesus. The first one is this, be a follower of Jesus yourself. Be a follower of Jesus yourself. This is all about identity. Who was Jesus? What was he up to in the world? He was the father's. He belonged to the father. He was the son of the father. And we are sons and daughters of the father, uh, as, of the father as well if we have chosen to follow him. See, disciples of Jesus are committed to following Jesus. Do you remember Jesus' message? What did Jesus go about saying? He said this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What he was saying was return to God's original design for your life. You were made in his image, return to that design for your life. This is who Jesus was. He was the exact image of the father. And because of his death, burial and resurrection, we too can be brought back to that image. And I know that you're sitting in this church building this morning. And you may even come here quite often. But I want to ask you, have you yourself turned from yourself? Have you turned from your sin? Have you turned from trusting in yourself? Have you turned from seeking pleasure in yourself to trust the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you repented? Have you turned towards Jesus? Are you just a member of this church? Or are you also a member of the body of Christ? And yes, there is a very big difference. Let me just meddle a little bit more. That the things that you do with your life, the hobbies that you have, the names, the, the titles that are attached to your name, all kinds of things that might give you significance in this world, are they giving you significance or is Jesus giving you significance? Where is your identity? And are you modeling this for your children? Are you helping shepherd your children through this? Are, you, are they getting their, their uh, identity out of the things that they do? The sports that they do, the activities that they do, the grades that they receive, the friends that they hang out with? Or are they getting their identity from Jesus? Are you modeling this for your children? Are you modeling it for others? Are you taking, here we go, are you taking out time to actually talk about these things? with your children. And I would recommend just being honest. This is tough. It's tough for me. And I just want to encourage you to seek your identity in Jesus as a follower of Jesus. If you are not a follower of Jesus today, 
you are not setting up your children to do the same. It's as simple as that. Be a follower of Jesus. Number two, be changed by Jesus. Disciples of Jesus are those who are changed by Jesus. They are changed by his Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a couple questions. Are you more like Jesus this year than you were this time last year? Are you more like Jesus today than you were five years ago, 10 years ago? Why or why not? Just good questions to ask ourselves. Are we being changed by Jesus? You cannot do this alone. You cannot lay that stuff down by yourself. But Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can help us do that. There's a couple ways that God uses, and I'll just mention a couple here. There are other ways as well that God uses. We've talked about these before, but one is just being a part of the body of Christ. And it, again, if you think that being a part of the body of Christ is just showing up here every little bit and being a part of the worship service, hearing a good message, that's really not being a part of the body of Christ. If you think it's about being a part of some program, um, but you really don't have relationships where you're connected with others, that's not really being a part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says this, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Paul is telling us that we all function together as the body of Christ. Are you connected to the body? Not just do you show up where the body is, but are you connected in relationship with other people? Do you have people in your life who can help you grow? Are you connected in a ridge group? Are you connected in an ABF class? And are you modeling this for your kids? Do your kids and others around you, do they see you depending on other people? And are you including them on the same as well? It's entirely possible to do that. Are you using your gifts to build up the body? Yes, you all have, we all have gifts that build up the body. A couple other areas, the word of God. Are you getting the word of God into your heart on a daily basis? There is no excuse to not be doing this. If you have a phone, you can go down, uh, download the YouVersion app and you can grab some friends that can hold you accountable and start some Bible reading plans. Get in the Word. I remember images of my dad growing up, sitting at the breakfast table. As I got up, I could tell he had been up for a while and he has his Bible open on our kitchen table, reading, our, reading his Bible. I remember that something that I want to model for my kids as well. I remember my mom taking out verses from the Bible and putting them on sheets of paper and putting them on our doors. And the word of God was important, I could see. We can't just talk about it, we gotta model it. Prayer, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Maybe just start with praying at bedtime or praying at meals. But let them also see you praying at other times as well. See, when we do these things, these disciplines, they put us in a place where God can do the work that only he can do in our lives. He can begin to transform our lives. Are you modeling this for your children? Are you modeling it for others? Are you taking out time to talk with your children and others about the importance of this? Third, we need to be on mission with Jesus. Be on mission with Jesus. See, a, di a disciple of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, they join up with Jesus in his mission. And we think about this, did you know that Jesus' very first act, I, I talked about it just a minute ago, but I didn't reference it completely. It was recorded in all three, or three of the gospels, there was one that was not recorded in, where he called Simon, Andrew, James, and John to leave their nets, to leave their boats behind, to leave their nets behind, and to come and follow him. It's a great scene. But not only did Jesus call them to come follow him, but do you remember the words that Jesus said? He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, Jesus calls all of us not just to follow him, but to help others do the same. That's why we talk around here about helping others follow Jesus. And you may say, well, I didn't sign up for that. I thought I could just come in here and I could hear a good sermon that would help me get through my week and listen to some good music. It would encourage me, and I'll come back next week and get recharged. Again, nothing wrong with that at all. But it falls very short of what our Father wants for us. We were created 
not to be a cul-de-sac, but to be a river of blessing to other people, to let God's love and his blessing flow through our lives to other people's lives. That's why Adam and Eve were created. We saw that. They were created to multiply over the face of the earth, God's glory. They were made to take care of the earth that God had put in their care. It was no different in the garden that he wanted his image multiplied over the face of the earth and God wants to do the same today. He, got, he wants to use you and he wants to use your family to fill your neighborhood, to fill your workplace, to fill your spheres of influence with the glory and the image of God. Here's the deal. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and not be involved in helping others follow Jesus. It's that simple. Jesus knew nothing of people who said they were followers, but they weren't giving their lives at some level to other people. And I am convinced that this may be the biggest reason that children, grown children, fall away from the church. It's because what they have perceived of Christianity, they might call it boring. Because they haven't seen the mission of God swell up in our lives. They haven't seen that they could give their lives to something more. I actually know, and we can, we can look at evidence of studies that have been done, that actually millennials, they care more about things in our society than other generations had before. They're very conscious about different causes. So I wonder sometimes if maybe we have failed our, ki- our children by not involving them in the mission of Jesus. See, being on mission with Jesus, doing church, it can be boring. But being on mission with Jesus is anything but boring. So let me ask you, are you giving your life for others? And how could you involve your kids in that task? I love hearing about families who serve this body together, that serve this church together. I love hearing about families who serve in our kids zone, couples that serve together in the same class and their kids are able to watch them doing that and it becomes, hey, we are on mission for Jesus together. Other families that serve in other ways. I love hearing these stories. I love hearing about people praying for those who are far from God in their lives. In fact, I heard the story just this last week of a family who began to reach out to a family that they did some activities with as a family. And they began to pray for this family. This family was far from God. They began to pray for this family by name every day. And then the father actually shared the good news of Jesus, had a gospel conversation with the father, the other father of the other family. And some of the kids actually were talking about Jesus as well to this family. Well, kind of fast forward after that happened and then uh, lots of weeks of prayer, many weeks of prayer, the family had this other family over to their house and some others came as well. And the coolest thing happened. The father of the family that they had been praying for sat down, they're eating food, they're kind of hanging out. And he basically looked at this other gentleman and he said, Hey, you, you pray for us. Because he'd been talking about how they had been praying for them. And he simply said this, could you tell me more about that? Isn't that pretty cool? The way the whole family could be on mission together of praying for others who are far from God in their lives. And then God just put an opportunity for them to really have a really good gospel conversation about Jesus right there in that moment. See, what God is up to in that family is that he wants to multiply his image. The image that's a part of that family, those individuals in that family who are following Jesus, he wants to multiply that to other families. Do you want to help your children follow Jesus? It's our primary responsibility to disciple our children. As a Christian, it's our primary responsibility to help others follow Jesus. Do you want to do that? Then be a follower of Jesus yourself. Bob Russell, uh, one of the preachers who's invested in so many, he shared the story this past week on his blog about some Egyptian Christians, actually 29 of them who were martyred about two weeks ago. 
If you know anything about Egypt, it has a, a large Muslim population. There's a, uh, a population of Coptic Christians who are about 10% of the population. And what happened was that they were looking for Christians uh, to, to, to martyr. These Christians were actually headed to a monastery to pray, these 29 folks. And one of the chaplains who survived the attack tells the story and says that on the Friday's massacre occurred after these Islamic terrorists marched off a bus, marched these folks off a bus one by one and asked them to deny their faith in Jesus Christ. This priest, this chaplain, told the story and he said that one of the survivors of the attack said that the 10 masked men from the Islamic State, that they did not simply open fire on the bus. Instead, these Islamic State radicals stopped the bus and they made the victims walk off and asked them one by one if they would renounce their faith in Jesus and profess faith in Islam. But all of them, even the children, refused. And each one was killed in cold blood with a gunshot. It, this is tragic news, but it's nothing that Jesus said would not happen. Jesus said these types of things would happen. And the fact of the matter is today, our children and others we're trying to share Jesus with, they are bombarded by our enemy. Whether it be in the areas of sensuality or areas of materialism, in the areas of other sin, or maybe that they would be on the other side of a gun asking them to renounce their faith. It is my hope for my kids, it is my prayer for my kids that my children without a doubt would say, I choose Jesus and I would choose him every time. But this starts with me. Am I following Jesus? Am I seeking to live my life in the way that he lived his life? Am I becoming like him? And it starts with you. Will you follow him so that you can help others follow him? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We, we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for him coming into this world, entering into history and rescuing us from our sin, rescuing us from the corruption that we brought up on ourselves because of our sin. For him making us new. And not only making us new, Father, but restoring us to the life that you had for us in the beginning. We pray, Father, that you would help us to follow you every day. Help us, Lord, to give our lives to you and give our lives to other people so that they can help us grow. And Lord, would you help us to be on mission with you? And would you help us to model for our children, to model for others what it means to be a follower of Jesus? It's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen.